Okay, so the problem says an aircraft is flying horizontally, right, so this way, uh, at a constant height of 4,000 feet, so that's this 4,000 feet that we have here, above a fixed observation point, so that's our little person right here. Um, at a certain instant, the angle of elevation is 30 degrees and decreasing, and the speed of the aircraft is 300 miles per hour. Okay, so let me write that down. So at, at a certain instant, um, the angle is 30 degrees and the speed of the aircraft is 300 miles an hour. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, so we talked about this last time, right? This is gonna be a derivative. Um, and so I'm going to let you guys tell me what, what that is. So this is like a fill in the blank. So what is that derivative, that 300 miles an hour? That's going to be the derivative of? Well, okay, so this is T right here, right? So that one's easy, but what, what letter am I going to put on top? Uh, so I've heard A, I've heard Y. I've heard X. Anybody have a D? <laughs> okay, so the answer is it depends, right? Because, so what does that 300 miles an hour represent? So it represents the plane going, flying horizontally, right? So what do, before I label the rate, what should I label before that? I need to label the right the value that's changing right the the value that the plane the fact that the plane is flying this way what is that uh what value is that changing directly uh well it's changing the angle but that's more indirect this right here right this distance down here the horizontal distance right from the person to the plane does that make sense so you need to give that a letter so that then you can label the derivative right okay so, so that's why it depends. So you can label it whatever you want. What do you guys want to label it? Y. Okay, trying to go different on us. That's okay. Uh, so then that, this would be dy over dt, right? So those two match up, right? The, the quantity that uh, is actually changing at this rate, 300 miles an hour, um, is uh, y and then it's changing at a rate of 300 miles an hour. Okay, so now, um, so that's good. Now the question, so there's two questions actually. Um, the qu first one is how fast, how fast is uh, theta decreasing at this instant? And then it says in degrees per second. Okay, all right, so, so what should we do with that business there? Any ideas? We need to, yeah, we need to translate the question into math, right, basically. So what is, um, what's the question? The question that we need to uh, answer here. Um, but we're not looking for theta itself. We're looking for, what is the question asking for? The change, right? So the derivative of theta with respect to t, right? That's what we're looking for. Uh, when, when theta equals 30 degrees, right? And dy over dt equals to 300, the, meaning the instant that they gave us above, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so any questions up to this point? Just the statement of the question itself. We're doing good? All right, so we've got the first step down, right? Yes, you have a question? Sage? Oh, uh, yeah, so uh, can you just like, quick uh, explain your thought process on A, side of the derivative of theta, because that's the yeah, because that's the question. So it says how fast, so this is a derivative, right? Right. OK. 
okay? How fast is, what is it asking you for? It's asking you for theta, right? So how fast is theta decreasing? So in other words, at what rate is theta changing? Or what's the derivative of theta, right? So all those are pretty much interchangeable. Um, you want to, you know, rate, derivative, it's like an immediate connection, right? You see rate or how fast, that's a derivative, right? Okay, so <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So now what's the next step? So that was the first step, right? The lay, draw the picture, label, and then write down the question. What's the second step? Formula relates our info, right? Okay, so now this time though, so we've got theta, right? So theta is important. Uh, we have y. Uh, which we don't really know, but we know we have a rate on y, right? And then we were given an angle theta. Um, so how many options do I have here? Well, first of all, does this Pythagorean theorem even come into consideration? No, right? Because the Pythagorean theorem does not include an angle, so we don't even think about it. So what should we think about? Trig functions, right? So we can think of sine theta, for example. Um, Sine theta would be 4,000 over what? It's opposite over hypotenuse, right? What's the hypotenuse? We don't know. So what should we label it? Wowzers, you guys are really going off the rails there. X for the hypotenuse. <laughs> First Y for the horizontal distance, then X for the hypotenuse. Okay, let's just call it big D for distance. <laughs> okay, so 4,000 over D, right? Which we know nothing about, yes? But we at least know that it's changing, right? It's not constant. Okay, that's one option. We also can do cosine instead. What would that be? Y over D, right? Uh, and then what's another option? Tangent, yep. Uh, tangent is 4,000 over y. Okay, so now notice we have a decision to make. So, in, and it matters which one we pick because um, it, if we pick the wrong one, it could be that we, uh, well, best case, we give ourselves a whole lot of extra work. Worst case, we can't actually uh, solve it. So, um, so what should we do? So what you want to do is you want to look at the information you're given and the information that you're being asked about and try to use the one that has the inform that information, what you're looking for and what you have. So notice they all have theta, right? So they all have theta, so that's they're all good there. Uh, but notice I'm given a rate about y here, and I have no information about d, right? Nothing. So should I use sine, for example? No, no, no. I should not use sine because I don't know d. Now I could find d, but what would it look like if I found what d equal? I would have to use Pythagorean theorem, right? To find d, that means I would have a square root in there. So same thing with cosine, right? That one even is, looks worse because you have a y and a d, and you don't know what d is, so you'd have to find d. OK, so which one wins? Tangent wins. Right? Tangent wins because it has a constant, so constants are easy to get to uh, get the derivative of. And then you have y, uh, which you know uh, the rate at which y is changing. So that's good, right? You with me? Okay. All right, so that's how we make the decision there. So let's, uh, let's use that. So if I do tangent, theta is 4,000 over y. Okay, so what would I do at, at this point? What's the next step? Derivative of both sides, right? Yeah. With respect to what? T. t, right? Always T. And uh, what's the derivative of tangent theta with respect to T? Okay. Times D theta over DT, exactly because theta is a function of t, right? Theta changes with t. Okay, and then what is this equal to? Sine. 
So 4,000 over y, when you get the derivative of, of that, remember you think of it as 4,000 y to the minus one, right? So you do the power rule. So what would you end up with? You would end up with minus 4,000, right? y to the negative two, right? But we don't like negative exponents, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just move it down as y squared. Is that okay to do? times, exactly, dy over dt. You guys okay with that? That I put y squared on the bottom instead of y to the minus two on top? Is that okay? So now what? <clears throat> now we need to find all the stuff, right? Yes, go ahead. Well, you have to remember where those come from. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, let me see. Okay. When I have tangent of theta, theta is actually a function of t, right? So if I get the derivative of tangent of theta, what rule do I have to use? I have to use the chain rule because I'm getting the derivative of tangent of theta, but theta is a function of t, right? So then you get the derivative of tangent theta, which is secant squared, but then times the derivative of theta, which is d theta over dt, right? Um, so then why is it that we end up with a dy over dt here? Well, because you get the derivative of y, and y is also a function of t, right? Because both theta and t are changing as T changes. Does that make sense? No? Okay, so good question. Oh, I don't know why I did that. Okay, um, so let's see here. All right, so now what do we do at this point? I plug in, yeah, I plug in what I know, right? So I try to plug in all my stuff, so um, secant squared theta, so do I know what secant? Couldn't you plug in 30? Plug in 30, right? So we're given the angle, so we know the angle is 30. So, um, okay, well we can do that, right? So secant of 30 degrees, well, who works with degrees? Nonsense. So what is this, secant? <coughs> pi over six, right? And then let me write it like this. So secant of pi over six, and then whatever we get from that, we'll square it, yeah? Okay, so secant, remember, is one over cosine, yes? Okay, and then cosine of pi over six is? So cosine of pi over six is? Root three over two, okay. So it looks like you guys need to practice <laughs> your trick. Uh, root three over two, so then secant of pi over six is the reciprocal, right? So two over root three. If you square that, you get four thirds, right? So this is gonna replace secant squared theta. Sound good? Yeah? Okay, all right. So I'm running out of space here. So I'm just gonna erase that. And I'm gonna replace this with a four thirds. Okay, now what about d theta over dt? That's what the question is, right? So I don't worry about finding that right now. Uh, let's see. And then minus 4,000 over y squared. What is y? Do I know what y is? Well, let me put what I do know. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, I know dy over dt is 300. Okay. <clears throat> so what is, what is y? All 
All right, okay, so now we need to find, find y. <clears throat> okay, so how do I find y? Solve for y, yes, good, okay. <laughs> yeah, I need to use one of the trig functions, right? Because notice, uh, I haven't used this 4,000 yet, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so tangent of 30 degrees is 4,000 over y, right? So y is equal to what? Uh, 4,000 divided by tangent of 30. What is tangent of 30? One half over, okay, that, we're doing better. <laughs> okay, one half over root three over two, which is the same as? One over root three, right? Okay, so y is root three times, well, actually, uh, let's do 4,000 root three. Okay, so that's what y equals, so we'll put that right here, 4,000 root three. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's that's it. That's all we need uh, because then uh, d theta. Actually, that isn't all we need. There's a bit of a wrinkle here that. So let me just go move it over here. So d theta over dt uh, is equal to. Uh, let's see. So let's try to simplify some stuff here. Um, so this four thousand cancels with one of these, right? But there's still one left. So is it okay if this four-thirds, I multiply it as three-fourths, it's going to be minus, right? Let's see here. And then I have times 300 on top, right? Um, and then what am I going to have left over on the bottom? If, if one of the four thousands cancels, but then I still have root three squared, so that's going to be 9 times 4,000, right? Okay, which last time I checked is 36,000. You guys with me or, or no? I just multiply by the reciprocal of this one. This 4 thirds, right? Because I'm solving for d theta over dt. Um, okay, now... Uh, so we can simplify this, but uh, I have a question. What are the units of this? These are radians per? Mm -mm. So if I go back here, uh, this is 300, what, miles per hour, right? So when I finish this up, I'm going to end up with radians per hour. And what does the question ask me for? Degrees per second. Okay, so we need to do a conversion. All right, so what's going to be my conversion here? So let's see. Well, let's simplify this a little bit. So this is, if I multiply the 3 times the 3, I get 9, right? And then cancel two zeros, top and bottom. Uh, and then 360 with one of the 3s reduces to 1 and 120, right? So now it erases. Okay, so then 3, uh, actually... And then 120 and the 3 reduced to 1 and 40, right? So this is going to be minus 1 over 160. Okay, so that's kind of nice. 36,000. Uh, it's, yeah, so 4,000 times uh, root 3. Oh, it's not 36,000. See? What is it? It's only three that is right. 
<laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting for you guys to stop me from doing these shenanigans. Maybe you shouldn't trust me. No. Okay, so 12,000, right? Right, because this right here, 4,000 times root... Uh, 4,000 times root 3 squared is 12,000, right? Um, okay, so anyways, uh, let's see here. So how does that change things? Oh my gosh, look at that. Do you guys see that? What is happening? Terrible. I don't know what's happening. I think that step on the bottom. I think I don't like this app anymore. I think I don't like this app anymore. Okay. <laughs> What is it? It's recording on the computer. What is it? Yeah, this one? I know. This is a different one. It is recording, trust me. You'll see when you watch it at home. <laughs> if you watch it at home. Okay, anyways. All right, back to the problem at hand. Let's get, let's get back to business here. D theta over DT. So let's go back minus three over four, which is four thirds, the reciprocal of four thirds, yes? yes? Okay, times, so this 300, I'm just gonna leave it there, 300, and then this is 12,000. Okay, all right, there we go. So now uh, we do a little simplification here, get rid of these um, zeros. Uh, three over 120 reduces to one and 40, right? <laughs> So then we end up with minus 3 over 160. There we go. Minus 3 over 160 radians per hour. All right, now are we good? Okay, so now we need to convert it. So minus 3 over 160 uh, radians per hour. So you guys remember how to do this, right? So you multiply by uh, unit factor. So Let's say you want to convert radians to degrees first. So what's the conversion? 180 degrees is pi radians, right? Okay. And then uh, what's the conversion of, so hours to, one hour is 3,600 seconds. All right, so then what is that equal to? Of course. This is our final answer. What is it? Does anybody have a calculator to punch it in? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure it's right. No, I'm not sure of anything. Point zero 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 two nine eight four one six degrees per second. Does that sound reasonable? Did I do that right? Yeah, so, I mean, well, it is negative. It's asking for decreasing, too, so that's right. Right, exactly. So because it's asking for decreasing, technically, if you write it positive, so if you're saying it's decreasing at a positive rate, you're basically saying that it's negative. But it doesn't matter. Anyway. Explaining that probably will just confuse more. But, um, but it is negative because it's decreasing. Yeah? Okay. What's up? Draw a picture. That's right. Good job. 
Okay, so pouring from a chute. So we've got a chute. That's a chute. And you've got... Okay. So see, you've got some grain things here. Oh, maybe you're gonna brew some beer. I don't know. Although I guess you wouldn't pour it in a conical pile. Okay, there we go. There's my conical pile. And there's the chute. <clears throat> okay, so what information do what what else do I what should I label? The height. The height? Okay, so the height of the pile. Uh, maybe I shouldn't ask. I'm just gonna label it H. Okay, what else should I label? Radius, okay. I'm again not going to ask. I'm going to label it R. Uh, okay, so what else should I... What else should I write down? Uh, yep, yeah. so the rate, so I have 8 cubic feet per minute, right? So... What is that? So if I write that down, so what would that be? The derivative of? Nope. <laughs> it's the first thing I told you guys when we started doing these. What do you look at that tells you what the derivative is? No, you look at the units, remember? That's volume over. Volume, exactly, right? It's cubic feet per minute. So what is that? Cubic feet is a measure of volume, so that's how you know it's the derivative of the volume. Right? Okay. All right, so <clears throat> 8 cubic feet per minute. Um, and then notice we have this other intriguing piece of information. It says that the height is always twice its radius. Well, that looks like important information right there. So how would I write that down? So the height is always twice the radius, h equals 2r, right? OK, so I'll just keep it there because that looks like it's in information I'm going to use. Um, OK, and then last but not least, this last part, how fast? Is the height of the pile increasing at the instant when the pile is six feet high? So that's my question, right? Yep. So what would that be? What is the, the H, right? Yeah. So how fast is the height? So how fast is the height changing? So dH over dt equals to question mark. When what? Six. When H equals six, exactly. And that's my question right there. So, um, so that was a pretty good job for the first step. What's the second step? Formula. So which one? Volume of a cone sounds pretty reasonable. Why? Well, because we're given the rate of the volume, right? We're given information about the height and the radius. So there's nothing more natural than choosing the volume uh, what is the volume of a cone? <laughs> One third. H pi, pi r squared h, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, um, so that's good. Um, should I get the derivative of that? What is it? Uh, you don't have to mess with it a little, but you should mess with it a little. Because notice that if I get the derivative of both sides there, what would you have to do on the right side? Since you have r and h, and they're both functions of t, what would you have to do? Well, besides from the chain rule, what is r and uh, h, what are they doing with each other? They're multiplying right each other which means when you get the derivative of that you would have to use the 
product rule, right? On top of the chain rule. So, um, so that means the right side would be a mess. But you have some important information. What is it? H equals 2R, exactly. See over here, you were told that H equals 2R. So uh, that means that you can replace R with H or H with R, whichever one uh, seems more convenient. Um, so which one should we replace? Should we? All right, so the problem is that you guys answered the question way too fast. Um, Oh wait, sorry, hold on. Okay, this is the problem. This is, oh. You replace H with two R, right? Okay, now you guys probably should not be really writing this down. I'm writing it down just because you guys told me to do that, but we're gonna erase it in a minute. Okay, so this doesn't look uh, like there's a problem, and there isn't really, but can you guys see, look ahead where the problem is? You don't have an H. What's the question about? The rate at which H changes. So if I get the derivative of this formula, am I going to get the derivative of H? No. So, um, so you know, you have to you you want to be careful here. Make sure that you're um, you set it up so that you answer the the correct question. So let's go back. So here I'm going to use. So not h equals 2r, but instead r equals h over 2. That way I'll be I'll have only h's in there, right? Does that make sense? So I'm going to replace r with h over 2. Uh, and so then what does that look like? So that's going to be v is equal to pi. So 1 third pi h over 2 squared times h. So one third, well, let's simplify it. So <clears throat> this is going to be 1 over 12 pi h cubed, right? You guys see that? Because the 2 squared on the bottom is 4, right? Multiply that by the 3, you end up with 12 on the bottom. And then multiply the h squared with the h, and you get h cubed, right? OK, all right. And now we can get the derivative, right? So now this is uh, no problem. So we're on the right track here. No product rule necessary or, or anything like that. On the left side, we'll have dv over dt, right? Uh, on the right, what rule do I have to use there? Which one? I have 1 over 12 pi h cubed. What rule do I use there? Just the power rule, right? Because what's 1 over 12? 1 over 12 is a constant. Pi is a constant. And so 1 over 12 pi, you just leave them alone, right? And then you, you do the power rule, right? So times 3 h squared, and then dh over dt. OK, so then we can reduce a little bit. So 12 and 3 reduce to 1 and 4. Four. Um, what else? Do I know dv over dt? That's 8, right? So that's this one right there. Um, <clears throat> what about h? I'm given h, right? Because it says when h equals 6, right here, right? Uh, how come? Uh, nope. So let's finish it and then we'll talk about it. Because we talked about it last time. But uh, it bears repeating. Okay, so what do we end up with here? We have pi. Uh, 6 squared is 36, right? Divided by 4. Uh, let's see, am I missing anything? dh over dt. 
So dH over dT is equal to, well, maybe let's reduce, right? 2 and 18. Well, I guess I should have done 4 and 1 and 9, right? Uh, so then what would that be? That would be 8 over 9 pi. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay, so back to the question about the uh, constants. So if I get the derivative of a constant, what is that? Zero. Okay. But if I have the derivative of a constant times a function, what is that? constant times the derivative of the function, right? So if the constant is just by itself, then? Right. Because the rate of change of a constant function is zero because it's not changing because it's constant, right? So does that make sense? Um, but if you have a constant multiplying your function, then you just pull it out. And multiply the derivative by that constant. Um, any other questions with that one? Is that all right? So it's getting a little bit easier, right? A little bit. A little bit. What technique do we use? Yeah, you use logarithmic differentiation, right? Is there any other way to do this problem? No. Why do you have to use logarithmic differentiation? Yeah, you have a function being raised to another function, and that's telltale sign, logarithmic differentiation. There's no other way to do it. Okay, so no power rule, no other weird stuff, you know. You just go through with the logarithmic differentiation. Okay, so uh, what's the first step? Ln of both sides, good. All right, so here we go. So then after that, we have ln of g of x. And then what does that allow us to do? That allows us to take the exponent, right, and then move it down. So we're going to have x cosecant of x squared times what? Um, ln of all that stuff in there, right? So ln of x squared minus 2x plus 3. Okay, so that's the first step, logarithmic differentiation. What's the second step? Take the derivative of both sides, yep. So take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. Okay. Um, So let's see here. So this is going to be, what do I get on the left side? Okay, so 1 over g of x times g prime of x. Let me, uh, I'll do it a different color so that we can distinguish it. So this is going to be g prime of x on top. Okay, now what about on the right side? Yikes. Yowzers. Product rule, what kind of product rule? How many functions do I have there? I have three functions. Have you ever done a product rule like this? You should have. There were some on the homework. Okay, all right, so what do we do? What's, this, <clears throat> what's the technique for doing the product rule when you have three functions? Um, no, not really, because the product rule is the product rule with two functions, right? So if I have three, no. So what you have to do, you have to treat it as if they were two functions, meaning you combine two. So like maybe, for example, let's say you take... Uh, 
So for example, here, x times cosecant of x squared, let's say, that would be your first function. And then ln of all that stuff would be the second function. So you would do the product rule with those two. The difference being that when you get the derivative of this first function, what are you going to have to do? Inside there, you're going to have to do another product rule. Does that make sense? So you treat it like one function, but then when you get its derivative, you're going to have to do the product rule. Does that make sense? So that's the strategy. And you can combine them any way you want. Um, but, yeah. okay. All right, so. <clears throat> All right, so let me, let me do a little labeling here just to make sure that, that we're on the same page. Is it okay if I call this the first and this the second? And then, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, like that. Is that okay? Yep. As like my skeleton of what I'm going to do? Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, so then what's the derivative of the first? This first x cosecant, x times cosecant of x squared. What's the derivative of that? Uh, one times cosecant of x squared. So one, well, I don't need to write down the one, right? So one times cosecant of x squared plus x times the derivative of cosecant of x squared. What's the derivative of cosecant of x squared? Negative cosecant cotangent x squared. Good. Okay, so negative cosecant of x squared. I'll do a little bit of erasing here. Cotangent x squared. And then times the derivative now of x squared, right? The inside, which is 2x. Okay. All right, so I encroach there a little bit. So let me, so that's the derivative of the first times the second, right? Uh, what's the second? The second is ln of all that stuff, right? x squared minus 2x plus 3. Ugh, barely squeezed it in there. Okay. Um, okay, and then after that, plus, right? So plus, <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, the first, which is just x cosecant of x squared, right? Times the derivative of the second. Now, what's the derivative of the second? One over all that stuff, right? x squared minus 2x plus 3, which is? 2x minus 2. Okay, and then what's the last step? Oh, yes. Doll. Oh. Well, I made it up. Oh, wait, which one? After the 3? Oh, yeah, I took it out because it was a typo, actually. If I left the x there, then you would combine them and then... So I meant to not... I mean, I did put it there, but I meant to not put it there. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter. If it's there, you simplify it a little bit, and then it's the same amount of work, basically. Um, okay, but then what's, what's the very last step? Multiply, Multiply everything by the original, function. the original function, g of x, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here it doesn't fit, but, but g prime of x is going to equal to all that stuff that we got, that big mess, times g of x, which is the original function. This original function right here. See? On our test, can we just put multiplied by g of 
Yeah, that's fine. No big whoop. <clears throat> okay, any questions about that? Is that pretty good? Okay, so um, all right, we're trying to figure out whether where it has slope one. Um, do you guys want to see a picture? Yeah. Might as well, right? Get Desmos here, our good old buddy, old pal. So x to the two thirds plus y to the two thirds equals one. So if I let me um, zoom in a little bit here. All right, so what are we looking for? We're looking for the points where the slope equals to 1, right? Uh, slope of the tangent line, correct. Um, so if I just, for example, um, just to, OK, so this is what a line with a slope of 1 looks like, right? Okay, so if you were going to say uh, how many points, how many points does it look like you would find such a thing? Two. Two points, right? One right about there. So that looks like about what is that? One, two point three ish, right? And then the other one at somewhere over there ish, negative point three ish, right? So probably we'll find uh, two points where this is true yes all right so graphing it is nice because it lets you kind of see what's going on um, but what would be the strategy here what what should we do if we're looking for where the tangent line has slope one so where is the tangent line ha have a specific slope what would be a good first step find the, find the derivative right because the derivative tells you slope of the tangent line right okay so that's that makes sense well, let's do that. We know how to do that. All right, so let's do it. So derivative of both sides with respect to x. So what do I get on the uh, left side? What is that? Two thirds x. What is it? Uh, well, okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, and then plus okay. times dy over dx, and that's equal to zero. zero. Okay, uh, so then we solve for dy over dx, right? So dy over dx equals to negative two thirds x to the minus one third, right? Divided by positive two thirds y to the minus one third, right? Okay, so what do I get? Well, this is just minus y to the one third divided by x to the one third. We want to have the um, exponents positive so that we can evaluate it because if they're negative then then that's no good um, but does that make sense yeah, yeah. so they're negative so we flip it and then the two-thirds cancel obviously uh, but the minus stays okay so well so that's good um, this is the derivative of y with respect to x right so now what do I do <laughs> Set it equal to one, right? Well, sure. Okay, so set, so set dy over dx equal to one. Okay, so minus y to the one third over x to the one third equals to one. <clears throat> okay, so now what? Well, I'm in a bit of a conundrum. Do you guys agree? Do you guys see the conundrum? Because what do I, well, what do I end up with? Well, y to the one third is equal to minus x to the one third, right? 
Yeah, the minus can go any, on any side. It doesn't really matter. But, um, <clears throat> well, well, now, is that what I was looking for? No. What's the problem? No numbers. I need a I need a number, right? A specific number. Well, this does give me some information, right? Um, this tells me that um, the tangent line has slope one. Okay, where y to the one third equals minus x to the one third. Okay. Um, now, if I simplify this a little bit, I can say that this is. If I uh, cube both sides, what would I get? That y would have to equal to negative x, right? Okay, so uh, this looks confusing because I, I get something like that. But um, do you guys have any ideas? So <clears throat> I know that y has to equal to minus x. But you also know something else. What else do you know? Well, how many points are there where y is equal to minus x? One. If you can look everywhere, how many points are there where y is equal to minus x? Infinitely many, right? There are so many points where y is equal to minus x, right? Or where y could potentially equal to minus x. But are you looking everywhere? No, that's the key. Where are you looking? Right, but we already we already uh, we already established that that so from this we established that the slope is equal to one uh, when y is equal to minus x. That's what this tells us right here. Exactly. We're we're looking for uh, for. So we know that y has to equal to negative x. Not everywhere. We can't look everywhere. Only where are we looking for it? On our specifically on our curve, which is this right here, right? So if we're looking for the exact point, we want to plug in y equals minus x into the curve equation. Does that make sense? Why we would plug it in? Because we're looking for that relationship on our curve. So that makes sense, right? Okay, all right. So uh, let's see here. So which one do you guys want to plug in? You have the choice. You want to replace x or replace y? It doesn't really matter. It's Replace y. Okay, so replace y with minus x, and then x stays there, right? Okay, so then what does this become? x to the two thirds plus negative x to the two thirds. That is, nope. What's negative x to the two thirds? It's x positive x to the two thirds, right? Because what is what does it mean to be raised to the two thirds? <coughs> you square, square it, get the cube root, right? It doesn't matter the order you do it, you're squaring it, so it's going to end up being positive, right? So this is the same as 2x to the two thirds equals 1. So x is equal to 1 half, and then, okay, 1 half raised to the what? Almost three halves, right? Yes, no? It's all algebra. Okay, all right. X to the two thirds is one half, yes? yes? How do I get rid of the two thirds? Raise both sides to the three halves, right? Because what do the laws of exponents say? It says you multiply the exponents, right? So then x is going to equal to, uh, what is that? So that's going to be 1 over, uh, that ends up being 2 root 2. 
right? Because it's 2 cubed is 8. Square root of 8 is the same as 2 root 2. Uh, what is 1 divided by... Or uh, wait, pause. Okay, yeah. What's 1 divided by 2 root 2? 1 divided by... Well, I'll do square root of 8 here. Oh, that looks pretty close, no? 0.3536 ish. <clears throat> and then what's the y value? Y is equal to minus x, we said, right? Negative 1 over 2 root 2. Okay. Um, are we done? No. We made a small omission. What's our omission? Because well, how many points did we expect to find? Two, right? Where did we lose the other one? Where should we have gotten another? Mm -mm. Yeah, right here, right at this step. <clears throat> because if we're solving x to the 2 thirds and we raise both sides to the 3 halves, this would be the positive or negative, right? Yes. 1 half to the 3 over 2. So you got to be a little bit careful, right? So we're kind of out of room here, but. Well, let me do this. Uh, let's see. What should I do? What can I erase? What can I erase that would be okay? Well, I'll just kind of make a little room here. Okay. If I have x to the 2 thirds like this equals to 1 half, right? Uh, let's say you cube both sides, right? So then you would have x squared equals to 1 eighth, right? Okay. And then to get rid of the squared, the square root of both sides, right? But how many solutions are there to x squared equals 1 eighth? There's two, right? There's a positive square root and a minus square root. So x equals to plus or minus 1 over 2 root 2. So this is one point, right? This one right here that we found. And then the other one is, uh, we'll write it down over here, uh, minus 1 over 2 root 2. And then what would be the y value? Positive 1 over 2 root 2. And that makes sense, right? If we go back to our picture, um, that's, that's kind of what, what our picture showed, right? Where is our picture? Where'd it go? Our picture. There it is. Okay. So it's this would be the other one, right? This one right here. So x is minus 0.3 ish or whatnot, and then y is the positive 0.3 ish. Does that make sense? Okie doke. Um, any other questions with that? Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? Okay. Okay, so um, here we're given very uh, little information, but we're given some information. Uh, we're told that it takes seven seconds to hit the ground, um, but there are a lot of uh, letters here that that we don't really know. Well, we know what G is, right? Uh, so what, let's do this. Um, so let's try to plug in as much as we can. So if G is minus 32, uh, then this would be minus 16 T squared. You guys agree? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then um, plus, what's the initial velocity? Minus 30. 
What is it? Well, yeah, so it, I guess it just depends on how you write it. Well, I'll just take it off of here. Okay. The, I'll take the mine. It, yeah. Okay. It's got to be somewhere. So, um, so minus 16 t squared and then plus, what's the initial velocity? Zero, exactly. Why is it zero? Because it is dropped. So if you just drop a stone, then what's the initial velocity? It's zero, right? It's not starting with initial velocity, so zero. So I won't write anything there. Um, so, and then what's the initial height? We don't know, right? Okay, so we'll just leave that there. Um, okay, but uh, what do we know? What? So what should we do? We we know the time that it takes to hit the ground, right? So you drop it, we don't know the initial velocity, or sorry, we do know the initial velocity is zero. Um, you drop it and then seven seconds you know uh, it takes to hit the ground. So what does that allow you to find? So if I, for example, do this, h of seven, and I plug in uh, let's see here, 7 squared, right? Plus uh, the unknown initial height, right? Okay, now, what is this right here? What is h of 7? That's 0, right? Because what's the height after 7 seconds? You're just told that it hit the ground, right? So the height after 7 seconds is 0. Um, so then... Well, whatever that is, I don't know. What is? 700, negative 784. Negative 784 plus h. So then the initial, that tells you the initial height, right? 784 uh, feet in this case. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> So that's the first part of the question, right? So the first part is how high is the building? All right, there it is. That's how high it is, 784 feet. Now, what about the second part is what's the stone's velocity upon impact? So what do we need to find the velocity? Mm, not at this point, but close. The derivative of the height function would be the velocity, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, so the velocity function is equal to the derivative of the height, right? What's the derivative of velocity? Acceleration, right? Okay, good. All right, but uh, what is the uh, derivative of the height function then? Well, why don't we write down the height, the new height function, the height. Uh, as a function of t is minus 16 t squared plus 784, right? This gives us the, the height of uh, the uh, stone after whatever number of seconds have passed, right? So what's the velocity function? Yeah, easy peasy, right? What is it? Negative 32 t plus plus zero, right? Because the derivative of 784 is zero. So, so this is the velocity function. So how would I answer the question, what's the stone's velocity upon impact? Yeah, when is the impact? After seven seconds. seven seconds, exactly. So just plug in seven, right? Which is what? Negative 224. What would that be? feet per second, right? <clears throat> does it make sense that it's negative? Yeah. Yeah. It does, right? Negative Why? Because, velocity. yeah, the height is decreasing. decreasing, right? So that makes sense. What's the acceleration? Just for fun. It's not part of the question, but... Uh, that's velocity. What's the acceleration, which would be the derivative of velocity?
What is that? Yeah, just negative 32, the constant, right? The gravity. That's it. That's not too bad, right? No. Okay. That one, yeah, no. Well, um. Everyone except me here on that one. No, I would give I would give it to you guys. Yeah, I mean we'll derive it uh, in cha uh, chapter five. Five, yeah, we'll derive it. Um, it's not hard to derive, but um, but yeah, for this one, I I would have given it to you. Yeah. So how in how in the um, how in the equity then go for the velocity v per second squared? I mean the sorry the acceleration. There's no acceleration per second squared. Uh, well, it would be because it's feet per second and then per second, per second. right? Because you're getting the derivative of Sorry. velocity, yeah. So you're getting how many feet per second per second, which ends up being feet per second squared. Yeah. Um, any other questions? No? All right, so we want to use the squeeze theorem to evaluate this limit. Um, so uh, remember the squeeze theorem, we have, um, just to, to recap here, just a, kind of a summary, uh, we have two conditions that we need to satisfy. Um, the first one is that uh, I need to be able to squeeze my function between two other functions, right? So I need to figure out this inequality. That's the first one. And then the limit of as x approaches a of the two functions that are squeezing mine has to be the same, right? So if those two conditions are satisfied, then we can say that the limit as x approaches a of the one in the middle is equal to that same uh, number, right? So, okay, uh, how do we normally uh, start start these off? Yes? Okay, good. So what, what's kind of our starter inequality kind of by default that we typically use here? So, which, so here I have two functions. I have tangent of x and cosine of 1 over x. Which one? Cosine, cosine right? Because tangent is tangent bounded by no, right? Tangent goes from minus infinity to positive infinity over and over and over again, right? So um, what you start off with is you know, we know that, for example, cosine of whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, Exactly. It's always between 1 and minus 1. Right? Doesn't matter what's inside of uh, cosine, it's always going to be between minus 1 and positive 1, no matter what. Um, okay, uh, let me make a little bit more space here, actually. <clears throat> okay, so then. Okay, so then multiply by tangent of x okay so now I have um, the following inequality my function tangent of x times cosine of 1 over x is bounded between uh, tangent of x and minus tangent of x, right? Mm -hmm. You guys agree, agree with that? Okay. And at this point, uh, I've satisfied the first um, the first uh, condition, right? The first condition is that my function, which is which one's my function? It's tangent of x times cosine of 1 over x, right? So 
I want this function, tangent of x cosine of 1 over x, to be bounded by two other functions. Now it can't be any two other functions. It has to be two functions that actually squeeze it, right? And how do I know that they squeeze it? That's what the second condition is all about, right? Because the second condition says, okay, well those two functions that you just found, they have to have exactly the same limit. If it does, then that means your function is being squeezed. If they have different limits, well then you know, it's pointless. You need to pick different functions. Okay, so off we go then. So maybe I'll put a one and a check right there. Condition one passed. Good job. Okay, now uh, what's the deal with what's the deal with the limit as x approaches zero of minus tangent of x and limit as x approaches zero of tangent of x. What are those? They're the same. What are they? Mm -mm. What's the tangent of zero? Zero, right? So what does that mean about the function that's in between those two? has to have exactly the same limit, right? So because of this, we can even do this. Condition two, check, passed, good job, awesome. You guys remember this? Who says that? Ninja Turtles, that's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's, those are my times. <laughs> okay, then uh, what can I say? The limit as x approaches zero. Is equal to zero by the squeeze theorem. That's right. By the squeeze theorem. Because uh, we want to make sure that our function that we're, so our function uh, needs to be um, in between the two bounding functions. So the function that we're interested in is this one right here, tangent x cosine of 1 over x, right? Why are we using that one? Because that's what the question is. <laughs> the question is what's the limit as x approaches 0 of tangent x times cosine of 1 over x? That's the limit we're actually trying to find, right? So <clears throat> that's why we always start off with an inequality we know, which is why we said, okay, well, I know cosine of 1 over x is between 1 and minus 1. And then from there, well, I just need to multiply it by tangent, right? So then that's why I multiply it by tangent throughout. All right, off we go, off to the races. <clears throat> um, okay, so how do we start off? I'll give you guys a blueprint, a... Uh, write down what we know and what we want. Okay, sounds good. Sounds like a good plan. All right, what do we know? We know that x minus... What is less than delta? x minus 2 is less than delta. And delta is we choose delta, right? Yep. To be whatever we want. Okay, now, uh, what do we want? Two minus three x plus x squared less than epsilon, right? Given any epsilon, right? Um, okay, so let's let's do a little a little work here. So we should probably reorganize this. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we typically do? Okay, so this is our scratch, right? Scratch. All right, so a factor. So what does this factor into? 
Uh, wait, do what? Don't we need to what? Subtract. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't write it. Why did I not write it? Zero? Yeah, because it's zero. Oh, yeah. The limit's zero, that's why. Yeah. But yeah, you would, right? So it's the function minus the limit, which in this case is zero. That's why we didn't write it. But yeah, good point. Um, so... Minus two, minus one, right? Okay. Now, um, so... Again, if we look back up at what we know, we know that x minus 2 is less than delta, so we don't worry about that, right? So um, we have this extra x minus 1 here. Uh, we need to bound this, right? You guys agree with that? So what's our strategy for bounding this? Suppose delta is... Less than what? One. Can I pick ten here? Can I pick a hundred? Can I pick a thousand? Can I pick point one? Yes. Okay. So you can really pick whatever you want. Most of the time, actually, not always, but um, but here we'll just keep it simple and say, okay. So delta. Suppose delta is less than one. Now, what follows from this? Then. Um, since I know x minus 2 <coughs> is less than delta, well then that means that x minus 2 is less than 1. Do you guys agree with that? With that? Which means that x minus 2 is between minus 1 and 1, right? Okay, so now what do I do? I'm trying to bound this again, right? x minus 1. So add one, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to basically get x minus one in the middle here. So adding one seems like a good choice because then I have that x minus one is between between zero and two. Okay, so that means that x minus one is less than one number in absolute value. Less than two. Would it make sense to say that it's less than uh, zero? No. no. Why not? Because it's not less than zero, right? <laughs> okay. That's why it would not make sense to say that. Would it make sense to say that it's less than one? But it, can you state it as fact? No. No, right? Because x minus 1 is between 0 and 2. So it could be greater than 1, right? Okay, so all right. So you have to make sure that you're uh, bounding this properly. So this is going to be less than 2. That's the largest it could be. <coughs> and what is this based off of? It's based off of this assumption right here. If I don't make that assumption, then I can't say this, that x minus 1 is less than 2. Yes? You with me? Okay, so continuing my scratch work then. Um, so, so this two, so what's the whole point of this two? This two is gonna basically go right here. Because, so then what can we say? Okay, so then x minus two times x minus one is less than two times x minus two, right? You with me? Is that okay? Did I make that substitution right there? And introduce the less than sign? Because x minus one is less than two, right? That's what we just said in, after we did all that, all that stuff on the left side right here. So, uh, okay, so now what? Well, uh, remember that uh, you already know that x minus 2 is uh, less than delta, right? And we get to choose delta, right? So this tells you what you want delta to be. Choose, choose delta to be the smaller, the minimum of 
one, which is the number we picked earlier, and what? Epsilon over two, right? Because if this x minus two was epsilon over two, what would you get for the original statement? It would be less than two times epsilon over two, which is epsilon, right? So that's why it's good to put what you want to happen because uh, then you can take the steps to, uh, to make sure that you get there. Okay, so does that make sense? Let me, uh, here. Okay, so, uh, yes. So when you were asking in one of the parallel questions, did you say for epsilon is equal to 0 0.001 or something like that? Uh-huh. How do you guys go about doing that? Well, so, uh, good question. So if epsilon, you know, so let's say epsilon is 0 0.0001, let's say. Well, then what would delta have to be? Well, if delta is epsilon over 2, well, it would just be 0 0.0001 divided by 2. That's it. And you can actually plug it in and verify that it actually does work. Okay. That yeah. Was yeah, that's it. it. Seems more complicated, but it, it, it really isn't. Okay, now, uh, let's see here. So can we use this scratch work to write down a, um, a formal proof? What do you say? I say we can. We'll do it right here. How about that? Okay, so proof. You guys ready? Okay, what should I write? Given any epsilon greater than zero, choose what? delta to be the minimum of 1n epsilon over 2, right? <clears throat> okay. So then here it's, uh, you know, all, basically what you're trying to do here is really um, just hit, hit the highlights. You know how after the football game they show the highlights and that's the best parts of the game? This is like that. You know, you already showed me all the work right here. You know, so I already know that you know what you're doing. Uh, you just have to make sure that uh, the what you say follows logically f from what you said. You don't have to put all the work in the middle, but it has to make sense. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So, um, so what follows logically from this statement right here? That del if you choose delta to be the smaller of 1 and epsilon over 2, then what can you say? Absolute value of x minus 1 is going to be less than 2, right? This one right here? Yes? So you don't have to do all this work again, right? Just if delta is smaller of 1 and epsilon over 2, x minus 1 is less than 2. Yes? Okay. All right. Um, and hold on, let me erase this stuff over here. Um, and uh, let's see here. If we want even, we can do this. F of x minus L, just for fun here, is equal to x squared minus 3x plus 2, uh, which is equal to x, what is it equal to? x minus 2 times x minus 1, right? So far so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, just a little bit here. So this is going to be less than 2 times x minus 1. So how did I uh, go from, how did I take that step? It's just from this statement right here, right? Mm -hmm. So I made this statement here, right? And that allows me to say that this is less than two times that. Does that make sense? Yes, no? You guys are looking at me funny. Do you guys agree that because I said that x minus one is less than two, then I can say that this line, 
or well, this line right here follows from the one before. Isn't the exact line two? Oh yeah, that's why you guys are looking at me funny. Yes, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> Just making sure you guys are paying attention. Uh, yes, that is what it means. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so this is the, uh, sorry, less than two times uh, x minus two. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so now we're good, right? Okay, and then uh, this in turn is less than two times epsilon over two. Where did that come from? I had set it up here, right? That delta is the smaller of 1 and epsilon over 2. So then, since I already know that x minus 2 is less than delta, and where does that come from, that x minus 2 is less than delta? From the definition of a limit, right? So you get that for free. You know that. You don't have to say that it's less than delta, you already know that it's less than delta. Does that make sense? Okay. And then what is this equal to? This is equal to? Epsilon. And then that's it. You're done. Does that make sense? So I know it's, you know, it's different than the kind of math that you're used to doing. I, you know what? I get it. Um, and the good news is that this is the only time that we'll do this kind of proof writing where you guys actually have to get, you know, dirty with it. Um, but you will see it again in Calc 3, so um, it's good to understand the idea. Um, the, the problem is that if, you, if you've never seen it and then you see it in Calc 3, then you have no clue what's going on. So it's normal to be confused about it, um, but at least if you try as hard as you can to wrap your head around it as much as you possibly can, can this time, when you get to Calc 3, hopefully it'll make more sense. And there you see it over and over again in a bunch of different situations in three dimensions, so then it hopefully uh, makes, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like banging your head over and over again. You know, hopefully makes it in there at some point. Um, so the entirety of the right column there is what you'd be looking for in the answer, every single part of that? Well, me, for me to know that you know what you're doing, I would have to see both. Right, with, with the scratch also, but then breaking it down that way in the proof section. Yeah, like if you were writing a math book, all you would need is the right part because you're assuming that the reader knows what they're doing. Um, but as a learner, you want to do the left part to make sure that I know that you know what you're doing on the right part. Yeah. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be written exactly this way. But the most important thing is that it has to have a logical flow, meaning that you can't state something as fact that comes from just nowhere. Does that make sense? So see how everything we said here comes from somewhere. Uh, for example, uh, remember we got to choose uh, delta, right? So that we know for free. And we know for free that x minus 2 is less than delta. Um, and where does this come from? x minus 1 is less than 2. How do we know that? From this choice of delta being less than 1, right? The work we did is actually over here on the scratch, right? But the um, but it actually comes from this choice right here of, of one. Does that make sense? Uh, now down here, uh, so here we just wrote it down, we factored it. Uh, where does this come from? This less than two business. It came from this what well, we stated right here, right? And then where did this step come from? This epsilon over two from what we said over here, right? This delta is epsilon over two. Notice we didn't really use any of this when if we only look at the proof, uh, we don't really need the scratch work really. Uh, I mean, the only part that maybe 
we might want to see a little bit more is when we say that x minus 1 is less than 2. You mean by being like, ah, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure that's true. Uh, but it's, you know, it's just a few steps and it's easily verified. Um, so that's the main thing. Does that make sense? Yes, Alex. Can, can you reiterate uh, why, why we say delta, choose delta minimum of 1 epsilon over 2? Well, that's to make sure that, um, you mean why the minimum? Why not just do epsilon over 2 only, for example? Yeah. Yeah, so you want, because what uh, you want to watch out for is, even though, uh, I mean, it's it's not likely, but since it has to work for any epsilon, that means that epsilon, if you are given a large epsilon, it has to also work. So like, let's just say, for example, if I say, let's say we were to take this out. Uh, of course, the eraser does not work right when I need it. Uh, okay, so let's say we take that out. It's no longer there. Delta is epsilon over 2 only. And you're telling me that this is going to work for any epsilon. Well, then I come around and I say, okay, well, what if epsilon is 100? Does it still work? It doesn't, actually, because if you choose delta to be epsilon over 2, then what is x minus 2 less than? x minus 2 is less than delta, right? But delta is epsilon over 2. So that means x minus 2 is less than not 1. It's less than 50. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So if x minus 2 is less than 50, that means that x minus 1 uh, is less than, what would that be? Uh, 51, I guess. So see, it messes up our initial. Um, so let me, let me, uh, mm, let's see. Um, what, can you explain what that statement means? Is it delta minimum one epsilon over two? It just means that delta is the smaller of either the number one or epsilon over 2. Because it can't be more than 1? Well, uh, because uh, your proof here, this, is based on this, uh, <clears throat> this work that you did right here. <coughs> so you bounded, so this right here, uh, x minus 1 you said that it was less than 2. What was that based on? That was based on delta being less than 1. So, but if you said from the beginning delta is less than 50, then you can make it be the, you can make uh, delta be a minimum of 50 exactly. like epsilon over 2. Yes. Okay. So whatever number you picked here, that's what you put up there. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. So it's always the same exact number. Um, so, in our examples, often it's always one, but that's just because we almost always pick one because one is easy to work with. Yeah. Any other questions with that? Does that make sense? Um, okay. That's all we have time for. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.